welcome to Type Talks. Today we have ISTPs and I'll have everyone introduce themselves. And so Joy, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Hi, yeah. Um, obviously, name is Joy and I go by Cosmic Death online. Um, I have been learning about typology for a little over a year and initially was typed as potentially being INFJ, but also potentially being ISTP. And it's just kind of made more sense to um, to go with ISTP since it's been backed up by other um, other typing services, such as working with you, Joyce. So thank you so much for your help with clarifying on that too. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of arts and crafts and I'm not gonna drag on, I'll just pass on to Brian. <laughs> uh, thanks for inviting me. My name's Brian and uh, I have a YouTube channel called The Ginzennial. It's not only for uh, ISTPs and cognitive functions, but basically everything I like. I've been, I've been into cognitive functions for about a year and a half. Uh, I'm 43. I took the internet tests, you know, many times over the years, but but didn't seriously uh, look into it until Winston's mom showed up on my channel about a year and a half ago, and it's been the deepest rabbit hole ever since. It's my favorite rabbit hole too. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And Brady. My name is uh, Brady. I'm 31 years old uh, from BC, Canada. Uh, chemical engineer at a aluminum smelter. I've uh, been into MBTI uh, pretty depth for the past uh, year. I uh, originally thought I was INTP, but uh, as I learned some more and uh, consulted with some folks, uh, found out it's ISTP. So it's helped me quite a bit uh, through the past year. So Really awesome. ISTPs most commonly mistype as INTP or even INTJ. So that's something, an interesting fact for you all. And Chufu? Hello, hello, I'm Chufu. Um, I'm a fellow ISTP. I've just been lurking around MBTI for the past five or six years. And that's, that's really about it. I've just been casually lurking, picking up things here and there. And I guess, you know, Joyce found one of me and, you know, dragged me on one of these panels. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. And David? Hello, yeah, I'm David. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. <clears throat> um, I'm an ISTP 5.6. I've only casually been into typology, so I, I don't know a lot about it, but I, you know, I, know, I know enough. Um, and I'm 52, and this is my second web chat ever. Uh, my first one with Ms. Ms. Joyce, which went quite well. And I, I can't believe there's so many ISTPs. Are, it's quite amazing. <laughs> I don't think I've ever, I'm not sure I've ever even met an ISTP before. So this is really good. Mm. Yeah, this is an ISTP social event now. <laughs> and Dara? Hi, my name is Dara Sock um, from Ontario, Canada. Uh, I graduated uh, here in a couple of years ago, but I, I still haven't figured out what I want to do in life. So I've just been like, you know, drifting here and there, just working, trying to find out who I am. So I'm really excited to be here, see you guys. I, I guess I'm an ISTP, I, I have no idea, but I'm glad that we uh, we can all be here today. So Dara's my in real life friend and he knows absolutely nothing about tech theory, but I'm pretty certain he's an ISTP. And so I just asked him, hey, you know nothing about the thing I love, but do you wanna do this thing? And he's a gentleman, so he said yes. I'm going to slowly but surely drag on my real life friends onto these panels so that they get addicted to typology, because that's my mastermind plan. And Carol? Hey, I'm Carol. Um, I'm an ISTP, I'm pretty sure. Um, that is all I have to say. <laughs> Hi, and Dion. From New Zealand. Um, yes, I was also an INTP for quite a while, mainly because I just sort of accepted the test results. And if I test now with that 16 personalities test, I'll get INTP again. Um, I hadn't really sort of thought about how those questions might be not really covering the full spectrum of types well enough to solidly identify them. But um, someone, when someone pointed it out and I actually bothered to to dig into it, well, it was fairly obvious. 
Um, I'm not as into MBTI as some folks, but I'm quite into uh, enough to understand myself. So very, very into T-I-S-E-N-I. -I. Cool. And hi, my name's Joyce, and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner, and I facilitate the instrument in organizations. I also type and coach people. So ISTPs, I'm wondering, how would you describe your dominant function, introverted thinking, TI? Well, I guess I'll start. Um, to me, it always feels like TI wants to, like, I guess, judge things, like, as best as it can in, like, in a vacuum. So I'm always trying to decide if something smells funny, you know, not literally, but, like, it's my function that I think of that I go stop and go, hmm, and it starts getting me thinking that may be me looping with TI and I, but it's always, like, thinking and deciding on something or just mulling something over, but that may be TI looping with other functions. Benjamin was on your, was on your channel a long time ago. And that was, uh, that was the video that really, uh, opened my eye to my TI. Uh, when he said the thing about TI is every time you hear something new, you ask yourself, how is that not correct? And the way that kind of plays out, um, it's always played out over my life, really specifically, like with like commercials, commercials on TV, whenever somebody is trying to pitch something that may not be quite square, it, it, it's red flags all over the place. Yeah. Same for, um, movie plots as well. Uh, I find it very difficult to enjoy certain types of movies just because I'm like, they just didn't think through all of the options or maybe they did. And I just have to let that go because of creative license. But so often it's just a case of picking it apart and thinking, well, some of this just really doesn't make sense. Like it just doesn't make sense. What is the point? And then I can't watch it. I'll just turn it off. Yeah. Something's fishy about this logic. Something is incongruent. It doesn't logically line up. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. I want to figure out why it doesn't make sense. Yeah, for me, it's like um, every type of new information I come across, I'm judging if it uh, makes sense with a, what I already understand. And uh, yeah, it's sort of a personal thing. So when I'm learning something, I need to know like the details of it. I can't just do it. I need to understand how it works with what I already know before I start doing something. And uh and and the terms of being personal, like it doesn't really matter to me if other people understand it, it either. So sometimes there'll be misconceptions. I don't feel the need to correct people unless uh, it directly affects me. Yeah, there's also the element if a ISTP is more strong with their extroverted sensing. Sometimes they don't always have to fully understand something to put their hands into it. So it's like, oh, let me tinker with this to know how it works. So sometimes ISTPs are tinkerers, not all of them. My friend Dara, he's actually like stereotypical ISTP. He's, I think at a point in his life, he was a mechanic and he did fix cars and he's good at it. And so there's also that brand of ISTPs, but that's like the only brand of ISTPs that's represented online, which is only like a small subsection, like probably 5% of them. But they do exist, like the tinkerers are are there. And sometimes SE just likes to jump in and see for itself and try something. So there's that too. Well, that's that's a good point. Actually, can I can I just ask all the ISTPs to put up your hand if you're not if, if you don't favor SE above NI? That's a double negative. I think it makes it a little hard to answer. <laughs> I, okay, okay. I want to put up both okay. hands because I favor them equally. I think you'd sort of know if you if you're high SE and I'm just interested to know how many are not not high SE then. I think it's sometimes hard to tell. I think for most ISTPs, they use their mm -hmm. SE and their NI equally. You'll hear from a majority of ISTPs, the middle two functions seem kind of equal. So I, I and I, while I'm SEing, so while I'm, say, I, I do car restorations and while I'm working on my car, I might look like I'm focused on working on my car, but I'm actually thinking about concepts and conceptualising. So when 
the NI and the SE are in the middle two slots, you toggle back and forth between them. And so sometimes while you're doing something physical with your hands, your, your mind's also wandering and you're thinking about something and it gives you almost more clarity to do something with your hands while you're also carrying a conversation or thinking something to yourself. It's almost like there's a little more clarity when you're able to tinker or do something there. Yeah, to me, SE is like a conscious, like I always have to consciously do it when like TI, NI is always like my default state. But I have to like purposely move into SE if I'm going to uh, act on something. So Brady, what, what is your hobby? What hobbies do you have? Uh, my hobbies are mountain biking, skiing, um, active sports activities and stuff like that not really into crafting so that's why i kind of never really related to istp before is i'm not i don't like tinkering or crafting things <laughs> i like the se i like is like moving things or pushing th things or going fast is, is the se that i experience okay yeah cool yeah, so you don't need like a particular type of SC. Like SC can exhibit itself in an assortment of ways. And so typically activities that require you to be present, see things as they are, or kind of immerse yourself in, in, in something in reality is extroverted sensing. Whether it's going for a walk, but taking a new path, or sports is a way some can do it. There's a variety of ways, so I'm not limiting it to like a specific extroverted sensing thing. With some ISTPs, they also don't relate to how adventurous, I guess, extroverted sensing is put. Because it's almost like within ISTP profiles, the extroverted sensing is so much stronger than how ISTPs experience it. So it's almost describing an SE DOM type. You know, a lot of ISTP descriptions sound like an ESTP or like someone with really high SC. Whereas there are just a lot of ISTPs who kind of like video games and watching anime too. And so when they read extreme sports, they're like, but I stay at home and I, like Dara has a collection of anime and Chufu has a collection of anime behind them, but video games too. And so there are different ways extroverted sensing can manifest. And so I'm wondering, what are everyone's hobbies here? What do you do in your free time? What are your interests? Um, I'll go first. Uh, model building, um, which really just comes down to anything that allows me to be working and creating something with my hands. And that includes the painting aspects. I do also do oil painting. But yeah, so it's just if my hands aren't building something, I'm not happy. How about you, Carol? I wrote these down so I wouldn't forget because it changes so often what I'm interested in at the moment. And I was like, she might ask this question, so I should write it down. Um, I don't do a lot of like what I would consider adventurous uh, things, but I really li like I'll take calligraphy, crochet. I know that sounds really boring, but I like learning how to do the different stitches is interesting to me to make something. Uh, lock picking, coloring, drawing, horseback riding, dog training. I was even thinking like if we get a dresser or something, that I can put together. I'm actually excited about putting the dresser together. Um, so things like that. And then of course, non-active things like cognitive functions, true crime, psychology, stuff like that is interesting to me. Yeah. I think most people who are into typology also have the intersecting hobby of psychology too, just as a byproduct, no matter what type they are. And so it's really cool. Like I said, um, I'm into car restoration. So I'm, I like everything about cars, really. Any, anything mechanical, really, and um, and um, into uh, understanding the human condition and how we apply that to our lives and uh, uh, where we fit in in the universe, I suppose. Um, and I'm not really into group chats, so it's really funny that I'm here. <laughs> Everyone else is probably thinking the same thing. <laughs> with the last comment <laughs> well i want to ask is it because we're not all like into group chats or is it because we don't know like our like dynamic in the group i'm sure if it's like just one-on-one -on -one with like you know like say me and joyce our dynamic would be different so is it just because we don't know our dynamic or is it we really don't on a fundamental uh, level like group chats 
No, I, I just get I get uh, social anxiety. So uh, it's the worst when I'm in groups of people, strangers that I don't know. But like you say, if I if I get to know the people, the anxiety goes down and and will disappear after a while. Yeah, I think um, the the fact that there's a particular reason and topic to be in this chat makes the the, the anxiety level very low. Um, if you were just slapped together with ten strangers here, yeah, well, I mean, that, that's that's a whole different ball game. But I think as long as you're in a like-minded group, whether it be hobby related or whatever, um, uh, you know, uh, your normal introversion can can change a fair bit, and you can chat to a whole bunch of people about your interest. Mm hmm. That's true. On a whole, when I interview introverts, they're more comfortable talking within the scope of their interests. So the closer you are to the scope of the things that they already like and know about, the easier they find to talk about it. Whereas I find when I interview extroverts on a whole, this is generalizing, it doesn't apply for everyone, but they're more comfortable talking about topics even that they might not be totally interested in. It's just a fun fact. It doesn't apply for everyone, but it's a trend I noticed with the panels. I probably have a lot of ISTPs going like, is that true or is that false? I'm kidding. And so Joy, what are some of your hobbies and interests? So I enjoy learning how to make new things. And I actually quite enjoy taking materials that I'm not necessarily familiar with and figuring out how they work with things that I do already know how to use. So um, something that I've recently been doing is making sculptures out of found materials or out of like secondhand materials. So I'll go like thrifting and grab a bunch of weird shit, put it together and just be like, what can I make with this? Now that I've got all this crap and it's in front of me, what can I actually build with this? And what can I make as far as like a sculpture? It won't look like any of the components necessarily, but they could be the skeleton of, um, you know, a sculptural piece. So mixed media sculptures is, is probably my number one hobby. Yeah, uh, painting, illustration. Um, yeah, I just like to learn how to do new shit all the time. Sorry for swearing. Am I allowed to swear in here? Oh my God. It's <laughs> <laughs> a minimum. All right. But yeah. yeah, mostly just making things like that. So polymer mm -hmm. clay as well. Uh, I want to learn next how to make a hydrocal mold, which should be fairly straightforward. I understand how it works, so I just got to actually do it. I've got the stuff. I just need to like set up a, a workstation. I just moved to Texas, so I don't have a proper workspace set up yet. But once I do, that's probably going to be the next thing that I, I do learn. That is so cool. That is so rad. There is a comment you said, Joy, that really resonated with Carol. You said that for you, you describe yourself less as artistic, but more as crafty. Can you go into that a bit? Sure, yeah. So it's not, it, I'm not expressing anything internal. It's not like I have this feeling and I want to express it, which I think is something that an artist would probably do. And I don't feel like I'm, I'm an artist. I feel like I just want to make something. I want my hands to be busy. Like Dion had said before, um, you know, if he's not making something with his hands, he's not happy. Or I, I might have just interpreted that in a certain way. But yeah, that's that's basically where I'm at is I want to be constantly making something new and learning new things, new techniques. And the byproduct of that just happens to be something that a lot of people would equate to being art. But for me, it's not necessarily art. Like, I don't care what happens to it. I'll give it away. I'll sell it. Like, I, I almost see it as a hindrance to have so many things that I've made because then it's like, well, now I have to deal with selling this to someone um, or I have to figure out where this goes now. I just wanted to learn how to make it. That's an interesting point there. I hadn't actually pondered that because I do art from time to time, um, but it's never to express anything. So I was just thinking as you were saying that, well, what what is it that I'm doing then? And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm playing with color um, and structure. So it's it's sort of like building something. I'm like, okay, so if you just lay these out, this field starts taking real great form, those trees and so on. Yeah. So I, I suppose my, my art would be SE art. 
Right. It's like you're you're honing a technique even as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Whenever someone uses the word new, you can infer they're talking about an extroverted perceiving function, whether it's SE or NE. These two functions, extroverted sensing and extroverted intuition, are looking for new in your perception and taking an info that's new. And so I just wanted to point that out. And so, Brian, what are your hobbies and interests? Well, I was, I was actually really excited to uh, partake in this part because everything Joy said was literally spot on. Um, I feel the exact same way with uh, with part of my content that I make. Um, I do uh, the band Tool, and I take their song, and I put like art over top of it into a video. And I've noticed that not only with that, but most of my creative process forever. Uh, I was an AutoCAD technician for a long time. And then when I started this YouTubing thing, I picked up Adobe Premiere and just basically self-taught. But full circle, all of that creativity comes from somewhere else, right? I, I don't consider myself an artist at all. I'm taking existing things and putting them together into something new. And uh, I, I think that was that was a really good a really good way to put it there. Also with SE, I think that's all SE, really. Honestly, you're right. And uh, sports, obviously, um, I was huge into sports. Had back surgery in 2000, so I kind of only jog now, but. Uh, yeah, anything athletic, anything exciting, uh, I'm down. Magnificent. And Chufu? Um, so like like Joyce hinted, I'd like have the stereotypical, you know, nerdy hobbies, watching anime, playing video games. Um, I also do like singing. I've picked up like voice lessons and singing, and so I've been doing that for about three years now. So I guess that kind of beats the stereotypical <laughs> ISTP artist thing. I'm gonna ask for oh. a song now. I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we well, just all want to hear you sing. We all want to hear me sing. Oh boy. <laughs> well, probably have to do it a cappella, right? Don't want to copyright strike on this video, Joyce. <laughs> mm, yeah. So there is something very interesting about your creative process to me that strikes me as more ISTP in how you sing. So any type can be into any hobby or anything. It depends on your approach to that hobby and how you do it and why you do it and your process through it that makes it ISTP ish the way that you approach it. <laughs> And so something really interesting about Chufu is that, you know, sometimes your singing instructors will ask you, put emotion into your, the way that you sing. And you're like, it's hard for you to generate emotions that you haven't, I don't know how to explain it. Do you know the train I'm going on, Chufu? Do I do, yeah. So, um, so like, like, well, so we'll use this example. Like, so say like I was, you know, singing like a love song, right, to somebody. My vocal coaches would ask me to sing like, oh, think of like, you know, your your crush or something when you like sing this. But like, if I don't have that picture in mind or, you know, if I don't feel that, then I won't be able to project that emotion into my singing as I do it. Like I, to me, I'm just kind of matching, you know, the song, the pitches, all this, that stuff as is. I'm not able to like conjure up this like emotion or like even fake an emotion I don't feel into singing a song I sing. It's also a little harder for you to imagine how it would feel like to be in love. That struck me as interesting too, because I'm like, you could take what he said as a little bit sounding like FI-ish, but I think what really does not sound FI about it is that like when he's asked to generate an emotion, FI has more immediate access to the emotional piano keys within itself. So just um, the difficulty with emotional replication when it requires it, to me, it was a little more on the TI side. So that's cool, Chifu. And Dara, what are some of your hobbies and interests? I usually like to spend time like alone. So like if I'm like watching movies, I usually like I would I would try to watch a movie by myself. Like uh, I I do like watch anime i do play video games i do talk to people like most misconceptions is that like introverts don't like to talk to people it's like no we do like to talk to people but like certain types of people you know like you want to give your energy out to people that you know will receive it well i, I don't know if that's like a really good explanation of it yeah, it sound, sounds right. And just up until the point you've had enough of it, and then poof, back in, back into introversion. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think ISTPs do like people. I think most people like people. <laughs> I find that 
when I talk to ISTPs, a theme that comes up is sometimes they don't notice how long they've been isolating themselves. So it's almost like, I like people, but sometimes I don't realize how long I go without talking to people. And then it's like, interesting. Now uh, it's a theme I see coming up again. That's true. Um, in fact, I've over, over the years, that can cause problems for us. Uh, you know, somebody else might think, gosh, why isn't, why isn't Brian talking to me? Well, he hasn't talked to me in three or four weeks. And then we will. And, and it's almost like, um, it sounds kind of weird, but we forget that other people exist when we're in ourself. It's, and, and that can go on for a long time. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I've actually gone, it just dawned on me. I haven't spoken to one of my friends since last year and they're a really close friend. And it's just, it doesn't occur to me. And, uh, and I've let friendships go for, I think I left a friend on red for four months, like a text message that she had sent to me. I read it and I was like, oh, I'll reply to that later. Cause I'm just not like, I'm busy. I'm, I'm in my own headspace. I'm working on a project. I'll get back to them. And I'm like the next day, oh yeah, I should probably text them back. And then a week goes by and then four months goes by. And I'm like, hey, you want to meet up for dinner? Because I happen to be free this weekend. Um, I've got a break in my <laughs> projects. And she was like, I thought you didn't want to be friends with me anymore. And that was not the case at all. In my mind, we were static. We were at this static point where, you know, the last time we saw each other, we were good. I had no information to update me that we were anything but that. So in my mind, it was just a static state of we're good. Um, regardless of whether or not we've spoken. So yeah, nothing had updated on my end, but on her end, it, it was perceived that, you know, perhaps I just didn't care for her. It's just not the case. Like I, I just suck at keeping in contact with people. Yeah. <laughs> so I forgot how to people and that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we're good now, but yeah, I think it's just a case of trying to relay that in a way that if you have like friends or family members that are just not into typology or they don't understand that lingo communicating in order to bridge some understanding and explain it from a standpoint of you know it's not that i don't care but sometimes i just don't think about that it just it's some it just doesn't occur to me sometimes and it's not that i don't care i think that could be like a helpful way to to bridge that gap maybe well said well said it kind of, it sucks because in those situations, they, we get labeled as selfish. Um, but it's, it, to us, it's not because it's literally not there. You know, selfishness is when you're making a choice. We're not even making the choice. It just happens that way. And so it's kind of a bummer when that works out that way. Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, asking somebody to, to be something means that if that person had higher FE, it's a more natural response that they can give. But but when you're asking an, an ISTP to draw on FE to not be so selfish, that's like, man, you're asking me to use my last stuff, the bottom of the barrel. It's like you don't you don't want to dabble with some of the higher functions. Got a lot of those. But if he, oh, it's not great. Mm -hmm. What's really cute about some ISTPs is they'll be aware of their FE to a certain extent. And I notice like something Dara will do is after I'm done saying something, they'll do this like one nod or like two, two nods. And it's like really an ISTP FE aspirational nod. It's like a visual affirmation to show you that I am agreeing with you and that I completely understand everything that you've said to me <laughs> even if that may or may not be true i just have to let you know what i'm thinking so that if he is there for yeah it's, it's just in a i don't know it's a, an adorable way i have over the years and probably even currently have interests that sort of stand by the side waiting to get a bit of attention easily have 10 15 hobbies um ranging from the investigation of some interesting topic which involves reading and until you feel you've fulfilled your knowledge requirements for, for the time being. Um, MBTI, um, 
I'm not going full on into it. I don't intend to ever go full on into it because it doesn't, it doesn't really give me what I, you know, I suppose the creativity aspect, but, but it, around the periphery of my life are a huge number of hobbies. Sometimes fish keeping was part of that. Um, I can't even, I, I restore motorbikes. Well, I, I did, I don't do much anymore. But yeah, I, I think, I'm, I'm sure ISTPs just always have these poking interests. They, they're prodding you for attention. You might give them attention, um, depending on how, how things are running in your life. Um, it's always something interesting, new. But but on the other hand, the same thing is many things will prod you and you'll just say, look, I, I don't care about that. I'm, I'm not getting into that. Um, couldn't be bothered. Too many other things. Yeah, for me, it's like every three months or so, I'll get a new interest around a topic of investigating. So like a few months ago, typology. Right now it's uh, comics. Before that, it was like bodybuilding. It's like every three months I like get into like as much as deep as I think I'm going to learn into a topic and then I get bored of it and move on to something else. But that's kind of reminded me of that when you're saying that, Dion. Um, but going back to your first question about TI, um, the, the, the sort of analogy of frameworks, and, and I don't know to what degree other types may have frameworks that they stick stuff onto, but the TI framework, I, I like the idea of that. And it's sort of the subconscious thing almost where all, all thought, all processing, all analysis um, subconsciously gets just stuck on some framework for some topic, for some hobby, for something, for ranging from uh, colors, how, how stuff works, how this works, coding, crafting, building this, how not to do this, building cars. If I'm going to be a car restorer, how much does that translate into bike restorer? Oh, what about being a sheet metal worker? Oh, but, you know, it just carries on forever. So you've got these little bits of frameworks in your head. And the change of hobbies, the sorry, the options of hobbies also slap bits of information onto these things. And then, as you say, Brady, you... You change your mind, something new. That that existing stuff doesn't go away. So you've got all these frameworks, all this information's coming in, and one day someone prompts you to get involved in something. Well, you've got this established framework on it, and suddenly you can take something up and be fairly good at it because you've already built up a good bit of information about that, not TE information, um, understanding information, uh, relating information. Absolutely. Yeah, good way of putting introverted thinking. And so we touched on extroverted sensing a bit already through the hobbies. And so I'm thinking maybe we can go to introverted intuition. I know David likes philosophy. Would you like to talk a bit about that? Um, yeah, I, I, I think of introvert, introvert intuition, um, <clears throat> what comes to mind is that a um, like a crystal ball and it's filled with smoke and and then at some if you're looking into it at some point a, an image will emerge or might or you know or a, um, a concept or an idea will emerge almost as if it came from a, like a, a revelation or a realization and um, which suddenly sort of it makes a light bulb um, moment where something that I might have been thinking about for a long time suddenly becomes um, uh, has much more clarity, and and then I'll be like, oh my god, why didn't I think of that before? You know, why did it takes so long. <clears throat> so that's kind of how I experience NI. It kind of sees how things will turn out. Sometimes the reason why I mentioned philosophy is that there's a misconception that ISTPs aren't into those type of things. And depending on the ISTPs, some of them actually do like philosophy and it's not an ex exclusively INTP or intuitive thing. Like there are some sensing types who enjoy philosophy too. So I just wanted to make that point. Well, yeah, in that context, um, I'm always 
philosophizing. You know, I, I went through a period where I was constantly philosophizing all the time in my mind <clears throat> and wanting to share that with other people all the time. And it became an obsession. And then at some point I had to consciously stop doing it because I, I, I was, um, it was, yeah, it was too obsessive. I felt like I was uh, wanting, there was some, I had to try and understand why I was, felt that I needed to do that all, all the time. So I had to stop doing it so I could figure it out. And um, <clears throat> in that same context, my, my, I like people so that I can uh, get another perspective or feedback on what I think so that I gain a better understanding of how the world works, how people work, and then understand myself better. Yeah. I, uh, I love philosophy. Uh, in fact, that's where I have all my fun is the middle two functions. I'm not sure if I even have a lot of fun at all with TI or FE, but uh, SE and NI for sure. Um, NI specifically, like with, with like, I think that's one reason why we get uh, often typed as INTP is uh, ISTPs who like to, you know, think about cosmology or astronomy or the meaning of life or, you know, philosophies in general, the, all those things. Those are really exciting to think about. And when paired with TI, you know, um, it really surprises me, like when I find an ISTP who's like super into astrology, something like that, where, you know, once you TI out astrology, it doesn't really work for me personally. Uh, but like MBTI, it's, it's, a lot of people think MBTI is like astrology for nerds or something or whatever it's called. But I just find so much more validity in the patterns. And, and I think that's a lot of NI and it's, and it's really fun. It really is. Heck yes. Typology is where it's at. Not biased at all. <laughs> I could piggyback off uh, what David was saying about um, NI being obsessive. I really relate to that. I feel like it can be it almost be a bad place to get super obsessed with the TI NI loop. And uh, some, sometimes I, I'm not sure I ever looked into this, but I feel like it's almost attached to your ego and I, like your path going down life, what you think you should be doing, where you think you should be at. And uh, yeah, if, uh, lately I found like if I purposely go into SE, I'm a lot uh, happier person. But uh, yeah, when you're thinking about where you are and uh, the universe and your your life's path with NI, NI is kind of a tricky subject to, to concept to figure out, but. Uh, that's sort of the way I feel, feel it's with me right now. Is it okay if I kind of jump in here as well about what David said about the, the crystal ball or like the, the fog? I kind of, I visually saw it, I guess. The way I kind of understand intuition for myself, at least, I've described it as like a, like an interactive or, or like a dynamic spatial field. Like I see and I almost, um, as things that are a certain distance away. Like when I think about something that I want, it's first just a little idea about something. I'm like, oh, I like this idea. This is a cool thing that maybe I could try someday. And it's really far away. It might be really like in my mind, it's almost like it's just a far away dot that's like a floating mass and it doesn't really have any shape. But the more SE details that I gather, just not even trying, just over time, I'll let myself I guess subconsciously collect information about what I want to do. I can start making that idea start to come closer and be clearer and closer and clearer. And suddenly it's like, oh, I know how to make this happen now. So I do it. And it, it just feels like it's almost like a, it is almost like it's in a, a spatial field. And I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like far away and fuzzy. And as it becomes more realistic and has more details around it, it becomes clear and then I know how to do it. I don't know if anybody else has uh, experienced it like that or, or has a way that they would describe their intuition. Yeah, I'll agree with Troy there, just what you said. Yeah, I think, I think there's a certain amount of blindness with NI and at some point uh, uh, images can emerge 
sort of almost out of the darkness, you know, out of the um, out of the void. And you think, well, where'd that come from? But and then I also want to ask too. So how how does like a casual viewer, I guess, differentiate that to like any? Because for me, that that was like my big trip up being typing between ISTP and INTP. And like when you just say it like that, Joy, it sounds very like stereotypical, like any extrovert intuition. So how do like how do people suss out the difference from like how what we're doing is ISTPs is NI and what you know any looks like? I think because I describe that more as just intuition, like overall. I see intuition as being something that if I force it, it'll become a problem. Whereas I think that there are instances where with introverted intuition, there's just a direct path that is kind of like, I know what to do. I know how to make this work very directly. Um, or I have a very strong suspicion that this is exactly how I should approach this. And I don't think that those are really moments that I would like hold off. Whereas with something like just letting something build, I don't force it. So I'm not pressuring myself to understand exactly how something's going to take shape. Um, whereas if I'm in a situation where I really need something to happen immediately, I'm making that in, like direct NI prediction or NI want, or you know, I've already eliminated every other possibility about how this could fail. What is the thing that is least likely to fail or what is the most likely to succeed. And I think that is more of an NI thing rather than an anything. But I don't know that I've answered that question at, like accurately. So I'm not sure. You tell me um, <laughs> based on yeah, that. Yeah, the, the, the description that you were giving, Joy, is um, for, for Chufu, as you're saying, for the viewers, isn't a description of NI. It's just one of the characteristics of how NI may come across to the person. I mean, re realistically describing NI is trying to draw in related items, re related thoughts, related solutions to a problem to some central theme, whereas NE is expanding options outward. Um, so I, I commonly have to, and again, this is not this is not the full N-I-N-E thing, but I commonly have to do that for my hobby where I have to solve something. I have to get this part to do this. And I suppose in a way, uh, similar for the car rebuilding, you have to achieve a fix of some sort. So you've, you, now you're N-I-ing, how, how can I do this? Um, I could do it this way. You, you sort of build up um, all the options that you can think of at the time, but then you might play N-E into that where you're okay if i'm going to do this one what how could this how could this be broken up into into um i'm not describing that very well um you know what you need to do but you now need to op open up your scope to look for uh, worldly options that can help you achieve this. I, I don't know if I described that well. It sounds a bit weird. The one way Joyce described it to me before was uh, like what you're saying, Dion, about finding the solution. Like NE is more like brainstorming creative ways to find the solution, and NI is just cut through. That, that's the right answer right there. And that's the way I feel like uh, when you're trying to pick something and everyone's coming up with new things with i think with my anna i was like that's the best answer but i'm not good at uh at finding the multitude or array of of scenarios i think and i is just your gut feeling on that that's that's the best way to go but, well i like to use uh, an analogy um that i have with intuition um it's like a fractal and uh and i would be zooming into the fractal so you get it zooming down into the fractal and NE would be zooming out. So you end up with the same image, the same picture, but you're moving in different directions. It's a different movement. Is a, NE is an outward movement and NI would be an inward movement, if that makes sense. Yeah. Introverted intuition is convergent. The intuition is leading to a most likely scenario or most likely intuitive thought. Whereas 
NE extroverted intuition is divergent. So it's leading to a multitude of options and possibilities. So NE actually becomes more uncertain as it generates. So the intuitive process is more chaotic and <laughs> in, in that sense. And so I'm wondering about everyone's relationship with the future. How far into the future do you tend to think? And I'd love to know everyone's thoughts. Good question um, for people that don't think into the future much. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give my... My quick bit. So, so for instance, when I was immigrating, then there's a very particular reason to look that many months and and sort of plan it out. I have to do this, that, that, that. Then you're going to apply for this, and so maybe up to a year into the future, you had to at least know the steps that were going to happen. But as far as um, not such big scale things, um, more related to my my hobby projects. Um, I'll commonly find myself thinking, okay, I could probably do this in a week uh, by a month's time and by the year's end, these things will be done and then I'm wrong on all of it, mainly because I just don't want to stick to my own thoughts on that. It's like tomorrow, oh, here's another interesting model. I'm just going to set everything aside that I planned and work on this one because I like to work on it right now. <laughs> my My motorbike, which I took apart to spray the frame seven years ago, telling myself, ah, oh, this will be, I know it's a bit of a big job, I'll take it apart, um, probably a month or so, and it'll be all back together, no problem, seven years later, um, yeah, mainly because I just couldn't be bothered to actually work on it. <laughs> so the end answer is a week. I still get caught up like when somebody's like, what do you want to do for lunch? And I'm like, whoa, lunch? When, when is that? <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding. But yeah, probably a couple of months at most because certain things have to be planned in advance. But even then, um, as Dion said, it's just kind of a crapshoot whether or not it's accurate because I get distracted so easily by other things that just take priority just because they're interesting. I'll end up yeah. being like, oh, I want to work on this. And then I'll be yeah. like, oh, and it's, wait. And it's, but, and it's <laughs> nice to get distracted. It's nice to, yeah. oh, that's an interesting one that I saw there. Let's have a look at that. Rather than fixatedly, you said you were going to do this. You, you promised yourself, do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so that's also a trait of lower down introverted intuition or higher up extroverted sensing. There's less of a future projection almost with higher up NI types, they think very long term, like they think very far ahead in the future. They future pace to the end of the future, basically. Whereas it seems like for ISTPs, it's like the immediate feels the most real. You might plan a bit ahead, but the reality is the present feels more real than planning for the future, even if you do plan for the future. The reverse is slightly true as well, though in that when ISTPs decide to do something spontaneously, you call up your friend and say, let's go for pizza, let's do this, and that doesn't fit into their, their semi-long-term plan. They've already planned out dinner to, tonight, tomorrow, and it's like, oh, I can't do that. So it's like <laughs> your, best, your best bet for spontaneous things is people that don't plan out. I often find myself uh, telling people, let's build that bridge when we get to it. It's almost annoying to try and conceptualize all the possibilities of the future when they're all equally possible, or even what's even more annoying is trying to conceptualize something that isn't likely. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly saying, you know, let's just, let's build that bridge when we get to it. There's, there's no reason to build it right now. Uh, so it's almost like the future is annoying. Oh my gosh, totally. I, went on holiday for the first time in so long uh, with an ex. I think we went to Japan. Well, I think we went to Japan. We went to Japan, but I can't remember all of the places we went because names of things elude me. Um, but on the planning of that trip, he asked what I want to do there. And I said, well, I want to get there. And then I want to do all the things. Because like, I don't know what I'm going to want to do when I get there. I just want to go and explore and we'll stumble across stuff. We'll find out what is available. Once we're there, we'll just, we'll have fun. 
right? Like obviously plan accommodations, where we're going to sleep and things like that. But as far as what I want to do when I'm there, I have no idea whatever takes our fancy when we get there. And obviously that was not a, a good answer for an ENTJ to hear. So he was just like, well, that's fine for me because I'm just going to plan all the things that I've been wanting to do. I was like, cool, that's good for me too, because I can just go along with whatever you like and I'll still get all of the experiences that you want to show off. So that was great, but also a little frustrating because there was very little room for just meandering and, and finding something and stumbling across something new. But yeah, does, more, that, uh, does that come across sorry. as like selfish though? Like I would imagine another type if we just answered, oh, you know, we'll have fun when we get there. Does that to other types look like selfish? It's like, I guess to them, it looks like we just, you know, we get there, we'll dictate what to us is fun. Whereas, you know, someone else might've had a plan. So is that where people think like, you know, someone being nice to be being selfish would come from? Um, I don't mind saying something about that. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, that's almost like FE where thinking about the future and, and building those bridges, you know, it might be a little bit annoying, but those are the sacrifices that we have to make to grow and mature. Uh, my wife, it's funny, Joy said that my wife's an ENTJ and uh, always wanting everything planned out and good to go. And I'm not sitting here thinking, I don't want to do that. That just sounds dumb. No, it's it's actually smart planning. And I think that's kind of how we FE a little bit is putting aside some of these things that we prefer uh, in, in lieu of everybody else. Yeah, my, my girlfriend will ask me, <clears throat> she'll say, uh, what do you want to do tomorrow? And I'll be like, I don't know, it's not tomorrow yet. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll know tomorrow. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I do have to plan for the future. Like if I'm doing a project, I have to plan, you know, all the parts that I need and in the sequence that I need to do them. So, yeah. Interestingly, on that, on that topic, um, uh, I'm, I'm involved with software and I'll commonly be asked for my estimates on how long something will take. And, and I'm usually the most correct in how long it really will take. So despite myself not planning, I can, I can see how long something should take others to do much, much more than they can. How about Brady? Yeah, for me, the future, I don't know, kind of gives me anxiety a bit, I would say. Um, yeah, I'm, I think about the future quite a bit, but not really how to get there. And I guess sometimes I'm worried that I'm going to be stuck with less opportunities in my future. So I feel like I, I, I want to be in a spot right now or in the future, I'll have more opportunities to, to try new things and do stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm always like changing careers and, and jobs, uh, Try not to get pigeonholed with one skill, so that I'll be stuck doing it for the next five to ten years. Um, so yeah, I don't really know how to explain it, but uh, in terms of like day to day, yeah, no planning at all. I'll just go with whatever anyone wants to do. Uh, I like people who like to dictate the activities, and I'll join along and tag along. But uh, don't really plan plan on my weeks or days at all. Awesome. Sounds very chill. Sounds like ice TVs are the epitome of chill. <laughs> How about Carol? I think most people kind of summed it up accurately. I don't know if because I have kids, um, things have, like my timeline has extended a bit depending on what I need to do for my kids. So I'll look maybe two, three months ahead of time. So I'm not scrambling at the last second because I've done that before and it was not great. Um, but before having kids, you know, I did whatever I wanted. I, as long as I had enough money to live comfortably, I played video games when I felt like it. I slept until I felt like it, like it just day to day, you know, there were a couple things, you know, that I have to get done, but I have the whole, this is the time frame I have to do it. And I'm going to do it whenever I feel like it and push my S my SE will help 
get me there. But I'm not thinking from this time to this time, this is what I'll be doing. Um, that feels so restrictive to me. Um, but again, like with kids, when I was pregnant, I went down all the rabbit holes of what I needed to do to prepare for that. Um, and that was 40 weeks on. So it really depends. Is But like my husband last night said, hey, we're going to go get food tomorrow for dinner. What do you where do you want to go? Like, I have no idea what I want to eat tomorrow. That's nothing. Just pick a place and I'll find something. It's not that important to me. You know, whatever you whatever you want, I'll find something. Yeah, that's interesting. And Chifu? So at best, like maybe I think like maybe six months in the future. <laughs> so like if there's like because. So like say like right now I have a dentist appointment that's like four months away and I put that in the calendar so like I know that that's there you know mull in the back of my mind but I want to say like at most six months anything beyond that is like I don't really know. Cool. And so Dara, how far into the future do you tend to look? Well, it certainly really depends on certain things that might or might not be important. If I really have to like prioritize certain things over other things, I would plan for them. But if I don't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's more important than the other things I planned, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. Interesting. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, what does the ideal day look like for all of you? What does like the perfect day look like? So probably just um, knee deep in crafts and home alone. And the cat decided to leave me alone for the day as well. Yeah, no work as well. Just basically alone and able to work on whatever I wanted. And somebody brings me food, but doesn't talk to me. That brings food, that sounds great. Uh, um... I, I like to get up whenever I've had enough sleep, you know, so I don't like alarm clocks at all. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I imagine working on projects until lunchtime and then going out with my girlfriend for lunch and uh, having a nice day, a nice outing, and then coming home and uh, investigating ideas and stuff on the computer, on the internet. I'm going to quickly add in also um spending time with my boyfriend in case he watches this and gets really mad at me but i didn't include him in my I, my perfect day <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll go the other way and say um anything that that that's not responsibility of others so uh, <laughs> sorry to my wife but and my kids if if they were if they decided to go away for a day um that would be that's like the only way I could picture like a perfect day is if there's no other stimuli or any, any randomness at all. It, it would just be me and myself. And that is it. Yeah. I got a weird one, but I'd probably sleep in as long as I could for sure. And then just w wake up, start exploring, walk, walk somewhere, walk up a mountain, have a new experience, go exploring, find a new thing. That'd be a pretty cool day. Chufu? Um, so I guess for me, like my ideal day, <laughs> I wonder why all ISTP so far said sleep. <laughs> Makes me wonder if we're a tired bunch. But yeah, I would probably sleep till, you know, my body said I was rested. I'd probably get up and then either work on like, either continue working on a project that, you know, I had to put on hold because I needed sleep from the previous day <laughs> or, you know, start up a new project. And then maybe in between in there, maybe like, you know, since I'm right now, I'm a singer, so maybe throwing like a warm up or two just to kind of keep in shape, do that, right? Maybe exercise, but mostly, yeah, just doing whatever I want to do, whether that's some something from before or something new that day. Carol? I mean, I think pretty similar um, sleep until I felt like getting up. I think right now, if this was, you know, in the next week, I, I really want to play just a regular video game on a console that is not child friendly. Um, I don't have access to that right now. And I miss just being able to sit there and play whatever the hell video game I felt like without worrying about little kids being around. Um, and then I would actually like to spend time with my husband um, doing something together and talking um, and then maybe researching something that I'm interested in at the time. 
I'm probably going to bed too late, honestly. I also I really enjoy playing video games as well. I've been playing video games since there were video games, you know, back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, I think. Oh no, seventies actually. No, back then I played Space Invaders in the seventies. That's great, Dion. One thing I found, and I have had a lot of them, which is quite cool. The one thing I found is that the perfect day only happens after a week or two weeks of moving towards this perfect day. So it has to be holidays. There has to be no work. You gradually have to get rid of all the chores around wherever you're living. There's nobody else there. It has to be from morning till night, you're allowed to get the things done that you want to do, get them out the way so that you're gradually getting to this perfect day, which is very similar to what Joy was saying. So you, you're going to end up with hobby stuff or, or project stuff or making progress on the things that you want to do. But I would add that I won't do it um, from morning till night, just the same thing. So probably by the evening, I'm going to head off to friends and go and have a chat and a bit of a visit. Um, but but yeah, just it has to be like, firstly, you you have no demands on yourself and no scheduled anything. And then you can get up in the morning and just do... Um, Hobby, hobby or project related stuff. And I don't mind doing a bit of gardening in between that, you know, take a break. You're not going to just do the same thing for the whole day, but, but you have the mental freedom to just be focusing in on that. Sounds like the life. How about you, Dara? Uh, perfect day for me. Yeah. Uh, usually that doesn't start until like 1 PM because I'm not a morning person. Like, at all <laughs> i i don't typically like work waking up in the morning so usually i i don't have plans for the day but if i don't i i do have some stuff that needs to be worked on i do like tinkering around with stuff figuring out how stuff works how to disassemble certain like electronic components and trying to see if i can rebuild it using what i know or learning from someone else that might be more in depth of certain topics. Uh, but yeah, aside from that, video games completely take my mind off of whatever I was or whatever I had planned for that day until it becomes more important or relevant during the day. Like plans aren't really my thing at all. Unless it's like a work day, then there's just, that's just time restraint. I have a question. I want to know, is everybody here not a morning person or are there some morning people here? So if you're not a morning, I guess I should phrase this as a question. If you are not a morning person, I guess we could raise our hands. Dion, you are a morning person. Okay. I'm also a morning person. I feel like the earlier you get up, the more time you have to do all the things that you want to do. I would say I'm I'm not a morning person in that I don't know if it's age or what, but it, it takes me a good uh, I don't know 15, 20 minutes to kind of get unornery, I guess. I don't I really, really need my alone time for that first fifteen or twenty minutes, I suppose. But you know, as far as waking up, that's it's not really a bother. It's just the first few minutes after. No, I'm only a morning person theoretically. In practice, no, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly find my brain does better later in the in the evening. I can, I have more energy when it's darker, and I can just really research things and put things together. I don't know. That's probably just me. I don't know. I was just curious to see if there was like an ISTP thing with that. I think there's a subtype of ISTPs who are like that, and where I think it comes from is. There's this, okay, so uh, there are many flavors of ISTP. One of the one of the subtypes I notice is the chill ISTP. And with the chill subtype, they kind of like to wake up late because they're a very go with the flow type of person. So they're like, yeah, you know what? I'm waking up at this time. I feel well rested. And sometimes they have that more consumy side that Carol mentioned. The ones that are more relaxed almost are more 
of that late late starter <laughs> type it seems like there's this trend of ISTPs and them kind of liking to keep things open ended there's this slowness to commit to a certain plan of action until you get there type of thing with most ISTPs of course this doesn't apply if they have obligations for work or obligations for schooling or their career plans that might differ but if you were to see them on their like downtime their free time <laughs> they're more chill and they're kind of like take things as they come types and the less obligations the more ideal the day <laughs> um, oh, definitely like agree. yeah i agree with that for sure don't like appointments <laughs> mm -hmm. obviously yes uh, keeping things open is a is a, a big aspect of it. But on the other hand, I'll I'll say I often see somebody or myself, and I just want to say, okay, well you've you've looked at all the possibilities. That's obviously the one that you need to choose. Do it. Just get it done. Um, the, there's no more pondering needed here. You've done the pondering. Finish it. So it's, it's, there's, there's like a point at which the keeping things open has no purpose anymore. Cool. Or, or in fact, when pondering serves no purpose, like you need to put something by the door as a, as a weight to stop it slamming. Just choose anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Primary objective, stop the door slamming. All right. All right, all right, all right. It seems like for the ideal day, a lot of you like activities that can be done alone. Typically when I ask that question, introverts tend to answer with solo activities or activities that you could do alone. Oh, and plus their partner, of course, because partner, that's an interesting trend. And so my next question for everyone is how does your repressed function, extroverted feeling, FE, show up? I'll go. Um, I, I like chatting to people, um, especially on a related topic, not just random, well, I mean, a bit of random nonsense, bit of talking nonsense is cool, but um, happy happy to interact with people. But I would, I'd, I suppose I'd have to say it's always on my terms. So uh, as soon as I need that pull out and on my own time again, I have to do it. Can't. So it's like, even, even with visiting friends, you go and visit friends, but then, oh, reach you, you've reached the full the, the fullness of being get out what i'd say is how how does my fe not display itself very well um helping people uh i'll, I'll help my closest friends if they ask but i'm, I'm not just going to be going out helping them um with stuff because i'm busy with my stuff so yeah that's that's where the selfishness comes out anyone else yeah, I could definitely uh, speak to this. So um, I'm happy to help other people, particularly if they're friends. Um, but it's only if I don't already have something on my plate that I'm more interested in. Also, I would say probably uh, I think sometimes my TI is so it, it just completely blinds me to what other people might expect me to to think if I have FE. Like having FE doesn't mean that I would say that it's acceptable to choose um, what you value over what is logical. And I think sometimes it becomes such a stark, a stark and blunt obviousness when I when I portray it that way. I'm like, well you can't choose to do that because then you're actually sacrificing what actually makes sense in favor of something that makes you happy. And or will make everybody happy. And it's kind of, I think sometimes that balancing act, and I can't be very specific here, I'm trying not to introduce uh, concepts that actually involve people in my life into a, a stream or into a, a video, but there are definitely situations where I'm like, sacrifice what you value or sacrifice the happiness of others in favor of what is logical and it, it doesn't go down well it's actually received very poorly. Um, so that's not fun. And then I, I find myself doubling back and the FE actually presents more as guilt and then apologies to try to bridge gaps there where I'm like, I'm so sorry I said something that actually upset you. 
or I think I might have upset you or, or something like that. I feel like I, I do a lot of apologizing after the fact when I realize that there's an aftermath to clean up. So. Yeah, for me, FE is, uh, uh, inferior function is something that I'm just really not very confident with. And I, I have this um, automatic sort of um, position where uh, people are guilty until proven innocent. So um, I don't trust someone until I, I get to know them and, and then I feel much more comfortable with them. And then I'll share a lot more with them. I'll talk to them a lot more. But until that happens, I just feel this um, terrible um, uh, insecurity, you know, so, you know, so I get, like, my focus keeps getting put back on how, how I'm feeling. And uh, so when I get to know someone better, that, that sort of goes away. And then I can just focus on them and finding out what they think. And so I'm really interested in people, but that initial meeting new people is, is, is uh, these, these feelings take my focus and make it very difficult to get past that stage. Shifu? Um, so I'd say like, yeah, I'm, I feel like probably, yeah, like Effie's probably the thing, the one thing I'm not that good at. It's like just having to deal with people. It's like thoughts and ideas in my head or, you know, stuff that I'm messing around with the real world, sure. But it's like once, you know, people come up, I'm like, ugh, <laughs> too many variables and too many things. So I feel like it's supposed to be the thing I'm supposed to be good at, you know, how to talk to someone, you know, all that social stuff. But I just know that I'm not. Birdie? Yeah, uh, FE, I guess it's it's a social anxiety and insecurity a bit. And it's, uh, it's actually a good motivator for lots of things. You want people to be happy around you. So you try to do things. But it's yeah a little uh the dumbest function so you're you you can see people are upset but you don't know why so you're you're trying to do things and you're not always um good at it but yeah it motivates you to try to do uh help people around you but you're not always super great at it um yeah also a bit i heard in some things which i relate to a lot the fear fe is like uh, the social norms like when you're at a group function and you just want to leave <laughs> it's it's hard for me to like say goodbye to everyone i just kind of like want to sneak out of the room <laughs> and, and without uh, uh saying hey but uh but uh, lots of people would think that's sort of shocking but like oh brady's a dick he just sort of left but yeah that's that's one way i feel about it and brian I would say FE is the function that I far and away focus on the most, that I actually have a, a conscious um, aim towards. I'm always, I guess that's because, you know, aspirational kind of fits uh, when I think about it that way. I don't necessarily, you know, want to engage in be nicey, nicey, um, but it's almost as if there's a little bit of uh, you have to do the work to get the reward, right? Um, once you do a FE more and, and it feels kind of inauthentic at first, you, you kind of feel like you're faking it a little bit. But once you begin to get that feedback and realize, oh, uh, you know, I really can do this, then the effort is becomes worth it. You know, so it's kind of one of those things where if you put in the effort, you're actually really going to get positive results out of it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to answer? Um, I kind of ask, like the awkward silence, is that because we lack a fear or because we know that someone should be talking, but we want someone else to talk. And so we all stay quiet waiting for that person to talk. Is that? Yeah. I think it's partially because of the polar extroverted intuition. So I find ISTPs and ISFPs to be the quietest groups I ever do. And it's because, you know, when you don't have a possibility generating function that is like 10,000 10, conversational topics, you're kind of like waiting for sometimes to talk. I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're responsive, I think. So I think there's like a, an aspect of waiting for a prompt in order to respond. And also probably it's a byproduct of us all wanting to remain on mute to be thoughtful as well until 
there's a an opportunity to speak and then it's like that little delay of like is somebody else going to do it should i do it i don't know <laughs> i think most of what everyone's thinking is like the same that's why we're all on mute because we're thinking about like respecting each other and all that stuff and trying to like read the situation read the room you know can i just say, can i just say that um if i'm in a group of people that i know really well uh, you know they're good friends or family um, I could I, I become very animated and I can almost appear as though I'm extroverted. Yeah. I think so, some of it is like we're we're like processing it in our own head and we, I think we don't realize how much we're in our own head. Like I'm a lot more quiet than, than I think I am. Like even though like the conversation, like especially in a group setting, the conversation's going on um, and I'm just sort of like taking everything in. I'm not putting in my two cents. And I don't realize that I'm not saying anything. I feel like I'm part of the conversation. You know, I'm just like the fly on the wall. And then I'll say something like three quarters in and be like, oh, Brady's standing there. You know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but. Yeah. I also, I also feel like this is a lot of people. I wasn't expecting this amount of people. And so when I was TI and I earlier of all the possibilities, this wasn't one of them and so i think i'm terrified that i'm gonna i'm gonna say something incorrectly and misrepresent myself um and so it's just i need a lot of time to process but like once we're not live and there are fewer you know or even if it's all of them i think i could be more open it's just this is a lot for me so. i'm glad that carol and i are like thinking the same thing i'm sorry <laughs> Dora, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joyce, maybe Joyce, you can tell me. Um, is is seven slot any like when ideas come and go? Because I would say, like, being in a group this big, most of the ideas that I've had that I want to say, it's so hard to hold on to them. Uh, it's like, oh, I have this idea that I want to say, but then I know I have to wait, you know, a few minutes and no matter how hard I try and hold on to the idea, that idea, it slips away. Yeah, uh, it could be a human thing too. The goldfish, <laughs> the goldfish brain. <laughs> but that's a really interesting question. To piggyback off of something David was saying, you said that you don't speak unless what you're saying is an accurate representation of what you're trying to say. Um, yeah. Uh, Often people think that, um, you, you know, my mind goes blank, but it's not really going blank. I'm just, I want to find the right words or sequence of words that explains exactly what I'm thinking so that the person doesn't get any uh, misunderstanding. That, that's, that's usually what it's about. Yeah, so I think that's one of the reasons why ISTPs can be quiet too. Because the TINI wants to be like very accurate and precise with what you're going to say. It's like, it's either you know what it is or you're going to stay blank because you don't want to fill it in with something that's not true. For instance, when I did the typing session with Carol, something very notable was um, I did the Dario Nardi NE extroverted intuition test. What that is, is that you bring up two writing utensils and you ask, one is the bride, one is the groom. Now, who is who? And why? Carol, do you remember what you said in relation to that? I think I said I didn't have enough information to infer which would be the bride and the groom. And also, it's none of my business. Why am I doing that? Yeah. So I oftentimes find when ice TVs actually do not have an answer, they'll go like, I don't have enough information. Or they won't fill it in with random ideas. Whereas extroverted intuition, if you're an INTP, you'd be guessing even if you, it was BS. <laughs> Just because it's like ideas. What if this? What if that? What if that? So that's one of the ways you can tell apart an I and an E. And so uh, any last thoughts before we close the panel, everyone? I wanted to ask uh, are all the other ISTPs the same in that you can meet someone and three seconds later, you have no idea what name they just told you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's almost like I'll never forget their face necessarily. I might see them years later and be like, I remember I saw you at such and such a place, but no idea what your name is. I'll reel off like 10 names because I'm like, those are general names for a human being. So Bob, Susie, what's your name? I don't know. But the face will stay. Yeah. 
so now if 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 I met anyone and they told me an airplane name and and asked me an hour later what airplane they'd mentioned, no problem. I'd know exactly because I've got great frameworks for for this type of thing. But my people framework, face, not face, faces are okay. Um, but like actually remembering the name, it has to fix onto some more relevant framework than an FE one if it's going to be remembered. And in general, that doesn't work. I'm awful with names. If you visualize it, if you try to imagine it as letters written, it might make it easier. Um, if you if you tend to be like a like somebody that is very good at remembering things visually, but not necessarily audially, if a name is delivered to you, try to imagine spelling it out. That might make it easier to remember or to prompt it again for your memory. I want to ask like when so so how do you rephrase the question? What's your name again without sounding like you just totally dozed off and didn't pay attention to them the first time? Like how do you fe that situation? I've, I've, I've done that I, as well. Yeah. So, so sorry, what did you say? What was your name? They tell me again, and one second later, I have no idea twice what they said. So do you just I'll literally bite the just bullet? admit it? Yeah, like I've forgotten your name already. It's not you. It's me. Like I, I'll probably forget your name before the end of this conversation, but it's great talking with you. So just bear with me. I'm bad with names. <laughs> this is an excellent conversation. And so thank you everyone for coming out and representing the ISTP personality type. It's really great to have real life representations of the type. So people aren't just reading a static 2D description, but they're seeing the type in motion. So they have a lot more information like the, the body posture or how you guys talk or what you guys talk about in like real life stories. And so it really adds a level of humanness and depth to actually have a conversation with ISTPs. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful time. <laughs> Liz, this is such an honor and such a privilege. It's nice to know all of your hobbies and interests, whether it's exercise, a sport, anime, video games, philosophy, or something crafty. It's really nice. It's really interesting to hear. It's fascinating how ISTPs don't consider themselves artistic. So although you're creating something that is typically deemed artistic, it doesn't feel like you're expressing a part of you. It feels like you're just creating something new, which is fascinating how ISTPs approach making things. And it's also nice to see how you guys like to figure things out, how they work and tinker with things or deconstruct things. I like hearing about the hands-on nature that some of you guys have too and how y'all use that kinesthetic learning style to its fullest advantage sometimes. And I don't know if the FE outros make y'all uncomfortable, but it's a part of my DNA, so I guess it has... No, but I know you mentioned that you had a time limit too, so... <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming out. Brian has a YouTube channel. Yeah, the Gen Zennial. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. He's representing the ISTPs with his channel. He's one of the few ISTP YouTubers. So, ooh, you even have a mug. You're going all out. <laughs> so yeah, go visit Brian's channel. He's got it. Thank you. <laughs> and it's good to have a conversation with you all, to have a social gathering, even though it's maybe something your, your aspirational FE does not always prefer large groups of people. <laughs> Thank you for coming to this, even, even if that's the case. Joy, you're really good at crafting things. A plus to oh, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Brady, he has like this awesome family orientation. He cares about his family, but sometimes FE makes it difficult. Like, you know, they're upset, but you don't know how to deal with how they're upset, so it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> which is which is adorable. <laughs> and it means you care, care a lot, and I, I respect that. And Chufu, you got mad singing skills. It's good to know an ISTP who likes anime and is passionate about VK. That's cool stuff. And David, thanks for overcoming your social anxiety to, to come here. Yes, bravery, risk-taking for the win. <laughs> high risk, high reward. <laughs> And Dara, thanks for coming out. You know absolutely nothing about typology, but you're a good friend. So you're like, Joyce wants me to come out. 
All right. Thank you for that adaptability and flexibility you gave me. It's really nice of you. <laughs> and I guess now you know you're an ISTP. And Carol, like you are absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And I, I'm so sorry. Your contributions are great too, but yeah. It's nice to hear how, you know, your relationship with the future is anything could happen. So yeah, you leave it up to that. Thanks for having me and inviting me. I appreciate it. I'm here for you. And Dion, it's nice to hear about your interest in World War II planes and aircrafts. That's interesting. And so thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you for your wonderful souls, your wonderful hearts, and it's a real honor. <laughs> thanks for having us, Joyce. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Joyce. This has been great. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. Okay. Bye. 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 Have a good night, guys, everyone.